Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago, the book of Exodus, chapter 10, verses 21 through 29. Exodus, chapter 10, verses 21 through 29. I think it's appropriate that this message is on Communion Sunday because the plague of darkness immediately preceded the Passover. And the Passover was what our Lord celebrated the night in which he was betrayed and which we commemorate here today. Part four, Pharaoh was not too bright or dim bulbs in Egypt. The 10 plagues, blood, frogs, lice, flies, murrain, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and coming soon, death. Blow fro, lie fly, moo bo, halo, daddy. Oh, I hope you can remember that so that you will know all 10 plagues by the time we get done with this series. You certainly have had plenty of weeks to learn that budak. Now, what we've learned so far about the plague of darkness, of course, last week we had Ken Olson with us for the Mission Sunday, but what we've learned so far, the supernatural, tangible darkness was a supernatural presence of the Shekinah glory. We saw that darkness is often associated with the Shekinah when God is about to judge. The principal god of Egypt that was being judged by this plague was Ra, the sun god. The believer who is in fellowship with God does not need to fear what is in the darkness. We know that David remembered the Exodus in Psalm 91, one of the favorite psalms of many of you here, because Psalm 91.10 mentions this plague. The darkness contains fearful things, but unbelievers love darkness, and so God will give them darkness for all of eternity. That's poetic justice. We've learned the light versus darkness is one of the key motifs and the themes of the Gospel of John. We've seen that deliverance from darkness is one of the primary illustrations of salvation in the Bible. We've seen that in the Bible, darkness is a picture of spiritual blindness, filthy sin and spiritual death, like the total non-life and lifelessness of earth before God created life. We've warned the young people and all of us that the way of the wicked is as darkness they know not at what they stumble. And whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. And God knows the thoughts of our hearts, not merely the words of our mouths. We saw that the removal of darkness by the Shekinah glory was one of the great messianic prophecies in Isaiah chapter 60. We saw that rejection of the light of Christ will plunge you into darkness. We saw that darkness is a picture of the vanity of life without God. That's the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. We saw that darkness is a picture of judgment during the day of the Lord. We saw that the darkness in our text could be felt. It says even darkness which may be felt, sort of like you can feel water when you're submerged and swimming underneath the water. We saw that it was at the cutting of the Abrahamic covenant that God gave to Abraham, that Abraham himself felt the horror of the great darkness. And it was at that time that God revealed the 400-year bondage in Egypt to Abraham. And that is not insignificant that God chose the plague of darkness before the death of the firstborn. We talked about those of us who are firstborns and what would have been like if our parents had been among the Israelites or among the Egyptians? Which side would you rather be on at that time? The Egyptian side where the firstborn were all slain? or those who among the Israelites placed the blood over the doorpost so that all in their houses lived. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall, serve, uh, shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great Substance, And then we saw the Shekinah glory passing between the pieces of the animals that Abraham had cut and laid on either half. God told Abraham about what was coming in Egypt. He didn't prophesy Moses by name, but Moses was the one who now fulfills it. And the plague of darkness is hitting Pharaoh to remind Pharaoh what is about to happen to him. We saw that hot, smoking darkness is what will characterize hell. And we saw that there is a darkness also in the Shekinah. 
For if God spared not the angels of sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And that brought us to a discussion last time of the reality of hell. Hell is mostly scoffed at or ignored by the majority of apostate preachers today, but even by some so-called evangelicals. There is a great percentage of the so-called evangelical, I would say neo-evangelical, I would say wolves in sheep's clothing, so-called evangelicals who deny hell. But it is a real place of darkness, a real place of fire, a real place of torment, and it lasts forever. It's a place that you don't want to be, and this life is the only opportunity that you have of avoiding it. With the plague of darkness, God warned Pharaoh what was about to happen to him. He was about to go to hell himself. We learned that the devil is not the king of hell. He's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Hell is where all unbelievers will spend eternity. They will all be found wanting and cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 15 and, 18, and 21, 8. We saw that hell is where rebellious fallen angels, the demons, are going to spend eternity. We saw that hell is where all the people who take the mark of the beast will spend eternity. We saw that hell is where the beast and the false prophet will spend eternity. And hell is totally dark and screaming hot. We saw that if you have no spiritual fruit in your life, ah, here's where it touches home. If you have no spiritual fruit in your life, it is proof that you are lost and headed for hell. For Jesus said, and now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Of oh, Jesus, it was said by John, whose fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. But whosoever shall say unto his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Matthew 7, verse 19, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit. Do you have any fruit in your life? Is it good fruit? Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. It's not enough to hang plastic bananas and plastic apples and plastic oranges on your tree. And if you're bringing forth from inside that which is evil fruit, it's a demonstration of your spiritual condition. Your works don't save you, but if you are saved, works will come forth from your life because the Holy Spirit is inside you and he produces the fruit. What do you have in your life? Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. We've mentioned many times before that Jesus talked more about hell than about heaven because, you see, he didn't want you to go there. Remember this. I think it should be obvious. But when all four Gospels record something, it is evident that God is making a point. Matthew 13. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 50, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 18, five chapters later. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cut them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands and two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Verse 9, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes, to be cast into hell fire. Chapter 25, seven chapters later. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Friends, hell is real. There are going to be people in hell who spend eternity in suffocating darkness that can be felt, in burning flames that can be felt, but they will not be consumed just like the Shekinah burned the bush, but did not consume it. We find it again in Mark. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than to having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Verse 44, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. 
Verse 45, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life than having two feet be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Verse 46, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. He says it two more times. We find it in Luke. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? Chapter 12, chapter 17. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. A visible reminder to us of what hell will be like and a visible reminder of the types of sins that God counts heinous enough to burn with fire. John chapter 15, verse 6, all four Gospels. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Do you understand? Jesus is talking the one whom the liberals like to portray as meek and mild and milk toast and wishy-washy and perhaps a little bit pudgy and smiley and never said anything bad to anybody. He told them the truth and they killed him for it because they would not hear. The appearance of the Shekinah at the burning bush was one of the main keys in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. Verse 30, And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. The Shekinah glory is seen in judgment in the doctrinal epistles of the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians 1.8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12.29, For our God is a consuming fire. This is New Testament, not merely Old Testament. Our hoarded material possessions did you know God's actually going to use those to judge us? Our hoarded material possessions will be used in fiery judgment against us. James chapter 5, verse 3. Your gold and silver is cankered. That means it has cancer. And the rust of them, those are metals that don't rust. But he says the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh. The gold and silver is going to be like cancer on you. It will eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Are we in the last days, friends? I think we are. The fire of the Shekinah will blaze and consume earth in the final judgment. 2 Peter 3, 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment at the perdition of ungodly men. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That's a description of the division of an atom, the word that's used here. Nuclear fission and fusion. Fervent heat is what it produces. That's what God's going to do to this world. Why are you hanging on to it? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. It passes away. Oh, you've heard me say it before, I'll say it again passes away. That word means it is wrapped up in a burial shroud. Even as they wound Jesus in linen garments, a burial shroud, it means the body is dead. Why do you keep hanging on to it? The world passes away. Why do you keep hanging on to it? The world passes away. The world is wrapped up in a burial shroud. The world passes away in the lust thereof. You don't keep hanging on to the corpse. Sodomites are given as a specific illustration of the judgment of hellfire. Jude, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance 
of eternal fire. Jude puts it in the present tense. Jude is almost 2,000 years after Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says they are still, at that time, 2,000 years later, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. They were not annihilated. There are those who like to say, oh, well, you know, the bad guys are going to get annihilated. There's a lot of heresy out there. That's one of them. Here they are, 2,000 years later, still suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah. Think United States. Verse 23. But God offers salvation even for such as those. Paul says this over in 1 Corinthians. Jude reminds us of that. Verse 23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. And such were some of you. But you've been cleansed and sanctified and washed by the blood of Christ. Hell is real, people. Hell is forever. And it is a place of conscious torment and agony. Oh, trust Jesus. He is the only one who can save you. And he will save you to the uttermost if you come by faith to him. The book of Revelation portrays Christ as the judge under the image of flaming fire. Chapter 1, verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Chapter 2, verse 18, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, his feet like unto fine brass. Speaks always of judgment. Chapter 8, verse 5, The angel took the censer and filled it with the fire off the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and lightnings and thunderings and an earthquake. There are many illustrations in the book of Revelation warn the earth that hellfire is coming. Chapter 8, beginning in verse 7, the first angel sounded. We're in the trumpet judgments here. And there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Do you remember what went on in the plagues with the plague of hail and the fire that ran along the ground? And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. And the second angel sounded, and it became as a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and to them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth, and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire, and smoke, and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Chapter 10, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud. What do you think that cloud is? What do you know about clouds in the Old Testament? Clouds that lead the children of Israel. Clouds that rest over the tabernacle. Clouds that rest over the temple. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Judgment fire is in the power of the two witnesses during the great tribulation. Chapter 11, verse 5. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must, in this manner, be killed. By the way, speaking of the two witnesses, since they have power over all plagues, and they can call down fire from heaven, the two witnesses are probably Moses and Elijah, both of whom had very, very strange events occurring at the end of their lives. Elijah was caught up. Was he in the chariot? No. In a whirlwind. Chariot separated between them. The chariots of God are the angels of the Shekinah. I wish we had time for that today. Elijah and Moses... God took him, and no man knows where God buried him. But there was a fight, according to the book of Jude, over his body, where Michael the archangel contended with the devil about the body of Moses. And Michael dares not rebuke him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Moses and Elijah 
didn't die the normal kind of deaths that other people died. And yet they did the things that we find in the book of Revelation. Verse 6, the very next verse. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Who prayed and the heaven was closed during the days of Ahab and Jezebel, and it didn't rain for three years? And he prayed again, and it had such a, a flood, and he outran Ahab's chariot back to Jezreel? That was Elijah. It says, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. They have powers over waters to turn them to blood. Who was it that turned the waters to blood? This is Revelation 11, 6. This is not back in Exodus. And to smite the earth with all plagues? That's Moses. As often as they will. In addition to all the things that we see going on in the book of Revelation and all those other judgments, we've got two guys going around who are doing all these other incredible miracles messing up the plans of the Antichrist. And he will be so glad when he finally kills them. And they put their bodies in the city of Jerusalem and they won't bury them. And after three days, a voice says, come up hither. And they both rise and go up into heaven. It says the whole world sees them. We have the capabilities of doing that today with modern television. Now we see the dark side. The false prophet uses deceitful imitations of God's judging fire to make the world worship the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 13, two chapters later. It says, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Do you remember the magicians in Egypt? Moses did certain miracles and then the magicians duplicated the miracles in the power of Satan. We see the same thing going on with satanic powers in the book of Revelation. Where we have the false prophet can make fire come down from heaven and he causes all the world to worship the beast. We find also a counterfeit resurrection where the beast that is slain with the sword is raised from the dead and all the world worships the beast. Dear people, Satan is an imitator. He is, he's not an originator. He's an imitator. But he has supernatural powers. Not as great as Christ, but he has supernatural powers. He has enough power where even Michael the archangel doesn't directly confront him. The archangel. Most powerful, most beautiful, most musical, most brilliant of all God's creatures. But he's still a creature. Satan can empower the Antichrist to perform all the same kind of miracles performed by Jesus and all of the miracles worked by the prophets of both the Old and New Testament, but the purpose is for deception. Paul gives an extended passage to that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, this is beginning in verse 1, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So he's going to talk about the return of Christ and particularly he's going to talk about the rapture. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, apostasia. We get our word apostasy from that. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, we're talking about the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's what we see in the book of Revelation going on. Paul's telling them here. Some people said, hey, the rapture's already coming, you missed it. Mid-trib rapturists, perhaps. Or post-trib rapturists. Paul says that's not the case. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Come on, guys, remember, you've been through this before, you people at Thessalonica. Many times I wonder, does anybody hear me? Does anybody listen? How many times I've said certain things, and I'll talk to some of you, and it appears that you have no clue? When I first entered the ministry, that took me by surprise. <laughs> I can remember 
The first church that I had is a senior pastor. Before that, I was an associate. But uh, I'd been preaching about certain things, and I thought I'd really made it clear. And one day, a sweet little old lady in the church came up to me, and she said, Pastor Spencer, I just went to such and such a Bible conference, and you know what the pastor, or what the preacher there said? And what she said sounded like she was quoting me, but she hadn't heard me say it. She'd heard somebody else say it. It makes us humble. It also reminds me that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established, just like last week when Ken Olson mentioned that passage in Acts chapter 20. He didn't know I'd been preaching in Acts chapter 20 in the evening services, and he quoted that passage out of Ezekiel chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 33, where if you don't warn the wicked, their blood is on your hands. It's a confirmation of the truth of the word of God. Paul goes on. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. It's the Holy Spirit who holds back wickedness. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let. That's the one who hinders. The word letteth there means to hinder. Until he be taken out of the way. When is the Holy Spirit's restraining ministry on earth removed? The Holy Spirit is always omnipresent because he's God. Where does the Holy Spirit dwell today? The Holy Spirit dwells in the hearts of believers. He will be in you, Jesus said in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, when he promised the coming of the Spirit. He permanently indwells the believer today, not like the Old Testament, where he came upon people for power, but then he would leave them, such as with Saul. When the rapture of the church takes place, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit goes with us. And suddenly, you think earth is bad now. And suddenly, what will earth be like then? Only he who now letteth, he who restrains, will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. When does it happen? After the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is removed, because the believers are all gone at that point in time. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The brightness of his coming. What is that? Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 24, which is the Olivet Discourse, coming back with the hosts of heaven in the power of the Shekinah glory to defeat the Antichrist and destroy his reign on earth. Look at verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, now look at these three words, with all power, dunamis, and signs, semion, and lying wonders, teros. Those are the three words that are used to describe the miracles of Jesus. We did a great study on that, those of you who come to the evening service, back when we went through the Gospel of John. We looked at all the different places where those three words are used of the miracles of Christ. But there's one extra word here that wasn't in any of those places where we looked at the miracles of Christ. It's a five-letter word. Lying. Lying signs, lying powers, lying wonders. The purpose is deception, but the counterfeit looks real to the unbelievers. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. If you're missing the evening services, you're missing the majority of our New Testament expositions. We encourage you to come to the evening worship services. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And now verse 11. Verses 11 and 12 are scary verses. They didn't receive the love of the truth. 
and because they didn't receive the love of the truth. Are you rejecting truth today? What area of your life are you rejecting truth? Are you rejecting truth? If it's at the point of salvation, you are in very great trouble. But you know Christians can reject truth also. We've just been talking about hell, for example. Do you reject the truth of hell? You're in trouble. Because there are consequences for every time we reject the truth of the word of God. Look what's going to happen to those who reject the truth of Christ and believe the lying powers and signs and wonders of the Antichrist. Verse 11. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. You remember what God did with Pharaoh? It says, but God hardened Pharaoh's heart that he would not let them go. God hardened his heart. What does it say here? For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Verse 12, and what's the end result? That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Folks, that causes me to tremble. I hope it does for you. The consequences of rejecting truth. Judgment, fires, and darkness are seen continually throughout the book of Revelation. Seven chapters in a row, as a matter of fact. Chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Seven chapters in a row. Chapter 14, another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of vines of the earth, for the grapes are fully ripe. Chapter 15, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Chapter 16, and the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Chapter 17, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, he shall hate the horn, shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Revelation chapter 18, verse 8, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. Chapter 19, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written to man knew but he himself. Chapter 20, verse 9, And they went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the city about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Just like the book of Hebrews said, Our God is a consuming fire. We thank him that we may call him Father. But that passage in Hebrews is a warning to Christians. And again, the Lord judges his people. Our time is up. We have a few more things to talk about. The Shekinah glory and darkness at the giving of the law. And how dangerous it is to want to place yourself back under the law. For it is a sign of judgment and of the curse. But Christ, through his death on the cross, has freed us from the law. We come tonight to, or this afternoon to remember the Passover. The reminder that God brought Egypt to its knees and Israel out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you 
for the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. How we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ came for the purpose of shedding his blood on the cross. Lo, I come to do thy will. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I come to do thy will, O God. How we thank you for him. For without him we have no hope. Without him we are plunged into darkness, a darkness that can be felt, a darkness with the thick smoke and flames of hell. But he suffered that for us. And just like there was darkness over the land for three days, so he was three days and three nights in the tomb. Father, how we thank you for Jesus. All our hope is in him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your hymnals and turn in our hymn of preparation.